good afternoon, everyone. My name is Faven Asafa, and I am a registered midwife currently inactive and um, currently in the position of uh, the Director of Healthcare Equity, Equality, and Human Rights at the Association of Ontario Midwives. So it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Showcasing Excellence, Empowering Epoch Midwifery Researchers. But before we delve into our program, I'd like to acknowledge the land that I am joining you from virtually today. I'm situated in Toronto, which is the traditional territory that is covered by the Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaties. It is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Sagas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. So today's agenda is brimming with insightful presentations featuring five remarkable speakers who will each share their expertise in a relatively concise 10 minute session. Following these presentations, we'll have a panel discussion where you'll have the opportunity to pose questions about uh, graduate school programs and research broadly. But before we embark on this enriching journey, allow me to introduce Bumi Inthavong, who is CAM's midwifery technical expert and uh, who is an integral team member of the Forward Project. For me, the floor is yours. Thanks, David. David uh, clearly didn't read fully her annotated uh, part uh, right at the end there. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, so this has been sort of pulling this all together very last minute. So thank you to the speakers for being reasonable and understanding everything that's happening. Um, so, um, uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today, um, lending your support to our esteemed speakers as they showcase their invaluable work and the hard work that they're doing. Um, our gathering today holds um, a, an important aspect, which is the spotlighting and celebrating academic excellence and impact individuals um, as they showcase the work that they're doing uh, and hopefully having a significant impact in equity deserving communities. Uh, the project itself is part of a larger initiative uh, that is uh, funded by Health Canada, uh, known as the Ford Project, IPOC Midwives Leading for Better Health Systems, which started uh, late uh, spring last year. Um, I encourage uh, basically each one of you who is um, at the event today to follow CAM's social media platform and weekly newsletters to stay informed and engaged in the work that is being developed with the Ford Project. So among the initiatives uh, that you'll see is an anti-racism online course that hopefully will be launched in the next few months, webinars that are specific on leadership and mentorship skills, um, and a large advocacy campaign that many of you guys are part of the steering committee um, that we're hoping to uh, launch uh, very soon, among other things. Uh, so we recognize that midwives um, don't have as much time and energy given the extent of the work that we do. Um, so if there is anything that uh, is a call out on the newsletter that you feel like you can offer some sort of support, but not within the full capacity, please do still reach out to, to us so that we can see how that can work within the schedule itself. Um, we really want the insight of midwives and how they're working on the ground to ensure that the quality and the work that comes from CAM uh, is is uh, sort of in line with what you're experiencing. Um, so before I take up too much more time, um, I wanna thank you all again for being part of this and being here today. Um, so I'll give it back to you, Fabian. Thanks. Sorry, this mute button thing, it never fails. Years into it. Um, so thanks for me. Uh, so I would like to present our speakers. Uh, first speaker will be Claire. Uh, Claire Ramlagan Salanga is assistant professor and chair of the College of Midwives of Ontario. Claire's PhD research in global health focuses on improving midwifery care and addressing health disparities. Claire, the floor is yours. Thanks folks. Okay, bear with me while I share my screen. And let's hope this all is nice and smooth. Okay, we're good. I see a head nod. All right, folks. 
Um, so good morning. Uh, my name is Claire Ram Logan Salanga. As Fabian has said, I'm a registered midwife and a professor, uh, assistant professor at McMaster University in the midwifery education program. I'm located on the lands of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation in a small town outside of Guelph, Ontario, which is about an hour west of Toronto. Today, I'll be presenting an overview of our team's work entitled Hypervigilance Being Plugged In, a constructivist grounded theory of the impact of racism on racialized midwives in Ontario. To begin, in 2023, our team published a mixed methods study investigating the factors that contribute to mental health of Ontario midwives. In that paper, our analysis underscored the mental burdens involved with the nature of birth work and how midwifery is organized in Ontario. Additionally, our findings uncovered uh, the, the factors that include the culture of midwifery and external factors, which had a large impact on midwives' mental health. Amidst these overarching themes, a subset of data emerged that voiced racialized midwives' experiences of racism within the profession. Their narratives identified the pervasive culture of racism in both hospital and clinical settings and its detrimental effects on mental health. These findings compelled us to deliver uh, or to delve a little deeper and explore the ways in which racism intersects with the mental health of racialized midwives. With this study, the one I'm gonna be talking about today, we sought out to understand and conceptualize how racism impacts the mental health of racialized midwives in Ontario. Before diving any further into our work, I believe it's important to position ourselves as researchers. Our team is a diverse group of academics, students, and a research assistant. Uh, our group included um, myself, uh, Vivian Lee, Malika Monroe, whose image is not on the screen, Elizabeth Cates, Kate, uh, Katie McKenzie, also another image that's not on the screen, Carlene Wilson, Wilson Mitchell, and uh, Liz Darling. We conducted our research with the understanding that our lived experiences and individual social identities may influence the study to some extent. We strove to use our collective differences to enrich our analysis. To avoid speaking for the data, we employed member checking session at the end of our study to ensure that our interpretation captured participants, perspectives, and experiences. So a bit about our study design and methodology. To address this research question, we used Sharmaz and Thornburg's constructivist grounded theory methodology to assess the subset of data from our 2023 study involving only racialized midwives. This inductive and iterative methodology allowed us as a team to immerse ourselves into the data and emerge with a theory that best aligns with participants' perspectives and experiences. In phase one of the 2023 study, it involved semi-structured focus groups and interviews via Zoom and used an open-ended interview guide. These encounters ranged between 59 to 88 minutes and were audio recorded and transcribed. Participants were de-identified and given participant numbers to maintain confidentiality. In total, we analyzed data from two focus groups and one interview from that original study, which had seven participants who identified as racialized. Our data analysis uh, was using a constructivist uh, uh, perspective, which began with line by line, open coding, then phrase by phrase coding, we had discussions, reflections, memo writing um, were used to question our codes and categories. Comparative analysis be between different pairs of research team members were repeated until no new information or interpretations emerged from the data sets. Thus, we assume and hope we really have achieved theoretical saturation. Again, as I said earlier, member checking was conducted via email to ensure that our interpretations of the data resonated with participants. New information uh, that was brought up from this member checking was also added to the overall analysis. So let's talk about the results. This is where the real punch is. So from the data, we coined our theory as hypervigilance being plugged in. Hypervigilance in the literature is defined as a constant state of alertness that involves assessing one's surroundings for potential threats to their well being. Herein, we describe hypervigilance as the exhaustive mental work that racialized midwives consciously and subconsciously perform to anticipate and adapt to racist stressors, 
so that they can evade consequential mental harm. This work can manifest in self-checking behaviors such as code switching, running through mental lists of must-dos and must-not-dos, or preparing escape plans when faced with racist encounters in professional settings. Based on our data, we posit that hypervigilance is a cognitive outcome among racialized midwives in response to three pairs of external encounters, the items that are in the gray, and three corresponding internal responses, items in the light blue. These groupings are microaggressions and social isolation that elicit exhaustion, implicit explicit biases and gatekeeping of systems that elicit, elicits educator fatigue, and facets of fragility and lack of institutional accountability that elicits disenfranchisement. This here that I'm presenting is a visual coding tree that summarizes our findings. We're currently developing a conceptual model that best represents this theory. So our first grouping exhaustion refers to the internal response that uh, to the culmination of mental overload that racist, sorry, that racialized midwives experience due to the perpetual external exposure to microaggressions and social location, uh, social isolation. These sub-themes represent participants' external encounters with interprofessional or interpersonal racism, either directed towards themselves or other racialized midwives or clients in clinical settings. Within the sub-theme microaggression, several participants discuss the mental burden tied to encountering covert racism especially when working in practice groups where non-racialized colleagues were unwilling to acknowledge or take action to mitigate microaggressions. The insidious nature of microaggressions left several participants feeling hyper-aware, with some going as far as to self-check and overanalyze how their own reactions or behaviors may have provoked the insult. Microaggressions directed towards racialized clients amplified participants' hypervigilance and sense of obligation to protect their client which had a negative impact on participants' mental health in both on and off call hours. Unfortunately, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna put up a, a quote from this uh, section, but I won't have time to read all the quotes. I'll just have them up here for you to take a peek at. Within the external encounter, encounter social isolation, participants um, spoke about the mental work associated with navigating hostile work environments. Examples of social isolation included racially motiv motivated bullying, wrongful reporting for clinical decisions, and denied consultations with spe specialist midwives. Amidst conflict, many participants felt a lack of support from non-racialized colleagues and discussed how pr practice dysfunction was often attributed to racialized midwives. Here is another example of a quote that captures this sub-theme of social isolation. Our second grouping of educator fatigue refers to the internal response to mental exhaustion experienced by racialized midwives as a result of working in a white dominated profession where they were forced to into unwanted positions of educating their non racialized colleagues about racist biases. In addition to spearheading systems level changes to dismantle racism that health systems seem to ignore or gatekeep. Within the sub-theme implicit and explicit biases, participants spoke about the mental challenges with continuously bearing the responsibility of educating their colleagues of the racial biases and blind spots to racism. And I'm going to just skip along here. Here's one of our quotes uh, that capture this sub-themes of implicit and explicit biases. Within the um, uh, sub-theme of gatekeeping of systems, participants discuss their frustration of working in a profession that places the onus on them to spearhead changes to dismantle racism instead of establishing appropriate policies and protocols to protect racialized midwives. The lack of systemic education on anti-racism, structured mechanisms for reporting racism, and comprehensive support systems for racialized midwives left many participants on their own to navigate workplace racism and were all cited as barriers to mental health. And again, here's another quote. And I'm seeing the time and I'm gonna clip clop along. Finally, our third grouping of disenfranchisement refers to the ways in which racialized midwives are pressured to remain silent about the racism they encounter in midwifery profession. Specifically, the external exposure to the facets of fragility and the lack of institutional accountability against racism 
within hospital and practice group settings disenfranchised racialized midwives from confronting racist offenses in fear of retaliation or being labeled as disruptive, thus exacerbating participants' mental health. Within the facets of fragility, participants reported an internal response of feeling powerless working in the white dominated profession and discussed how race, cultural differences and language barriers often left them feeling at the bottom of the ladder. Here, I'm just gonna go ahead, is another example of that um, feeling. Um, within the sub-theme of lack of institutional accountability, participants reported that external exposure to racist harassment and discrimination in practice groups and hospital settings was rarely, rarely acknowledged or followed with action to reprimand the perpetrator. Instead, racialized midwives were often blamed or coerced to being culpable for conflicts that arose. A lack of comprehensive supportive systems, including policies and protocols to combat this racism, um, and the failure to hold perpetrators accountable for their racist actions left many participants with the burden of coping with racialized trauma on their own. Again, another example, and I'll wrap it up right now. So participants' recommendations um, included profession-specific institutions should provide access to racially or ethnically concordant mental health uh, practitioners uh, to support them through uh, uh, co uh, counseling and also having support groups for midwives, for racialized midwives, as well as mandatory anti-racism workshops, education trainings that are linked to professional renewal. And lastly, I'm just gonna flip through that real quickly, sorry. Uh, implications is really just bringing us uh, attention to the stresses that racialized midwives face, not only in the job that they do daily, but also this back, this hum, this experience that is being carried of hypervigilance throughout their um, profession. And we need to deal with it. Uh, thank you all for your time. I'm sorry that I went over, but now I'm done. Any questions? Thank you, Claire, for that presentation. And just a reminder, you can type your questions in the chat box, or you could uh, raise a virtual hand if you'd rather ask your question out loud instead. And as we proceed through the rest of the um, presentations, uh, you can always type in your questions or comments in the chat box during the presentation in case you forget it at the end. See that there is, um... oh, no. Maybe there's a question coming in. Okay. Oh, Susanna, here you are. Can I ask you a question, Claire? Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see like how we actually have to overthink when I when we do things, and I can totally relate to that. And one of the uh, implications for future uh, strategies was uh, mandatory workshops, and I wonder how. Is there, maybe there is, and I'm very ignorant about it, but how effective are to do workshops in interraces to actually tackle uh, system change? It's a great question. And I, I don't have an answer for you. Um, I don't have the actual numbers to say, you know, you know, if you attend this, what are your outcomes? Um, I think in one of the pieces, this is not in the study, no one said this. I think this is just my thought. Um, because I face that question quite a lot in um, class spaces and other spaces of like, well, you make me do a, a workshop. Does it really change anything? Um, I think a lot of change has to start to happen with the individual. And sometimes we feel like, you know, this issue doesn't actually have anything to do with me. So I'm not really interested. I'm not going to invest much time into it. And I think by repeated exposure um, and actually having to, you know, at some point, like the light bulb goes off or you start to think about it and, and it starts to reflect in some aspect of your life, um, you start to hopefully start to think about how this can actually affect the work that you do or the people, your friends, your colleagues, whoever. And so I don't think it's a bad thing, um, but I but I do think that, you know, for us to see big systems change, we do need to like it does start with the individual. It has to start from like me and my colleague and then my next colleague and then my next colleague. And we start to have a culture change, a shift. Um, and that's really slow and sluggish, but it's got to start somewhere. So that's my two cents. 
Thanks, everyone. And this will be a paper soon. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Thank you for adding to the midwifery specific research that we absolutely need. Um, all right, so our next speaker is uh, Susanna Ku, and Susanna is an Asian Latino midwife with a rich heritage in Peruvian and Canadian midwifery. Currently, she is a PhD candidate in global health at McMaster University, focusing on the challenges and innovations in midwifery during crisis. Over to you, Susanna. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you see it like full? I don't, I don't know what I've done from here. It's the PowerPoint. It's not in presentation mode right now. So we're seeing uh, your PowerPoint as you Let would see, see it. Let me see if I can actually make a presentation mode here. Is that now without? Yes. 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 Okay. Right. Thank you. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and then share with you some of the path that I'm doing as a PhD candidate. Uh, this is a work in progress and it has been a work in progress for some years now. Um, I am Susana Ku. I am actually right now in Brazil, in Brasilia. I am attending a humanizing birth and I am gonna say this now because over the presentation that I'm going to, to do today, my PhD work has helped me to connect with my roots in the world, not only for when I, where I'm coming from, but also my language and my community. So my research started as, um, before even COVID, it started about like how maybe free services work in Canada and in and in Peru, where I used to be a midwife, and then how our services are impacted also by the way of our context, like the, the health system, the culture, um, what actually people expect from midwifery care too. So my research question seeks to determine like how did the COVID-19 pandemic impacted midwifery services in GTA and in Lima Metropolitana? And I had to be very specific about my question because my brain tends to go everywhere. So I needed to decide to focus on one thing. And then so um, with the support of my uh, supervisor, which is Liz, Liz Darling, um, I decided to do a collective case study. Uh, and I'm using a qualitative approach meaning that I am coming from a constructivist standpoint and the people or the data that I'm going to start researching, I'm going to construct the truth. I'm not trying to universalize the, the, the answers. This is very specific for the context that I'm looking at the information from. Um, so I'm, I'm using the guidance from stakes approach, sorry for the collective case study, and I'm looking into the quantum. So the quantum is the whole, um, the whole theory constructed by those, these two cases. And these two cases are um, also fed by the small units of analysis I'm going to explain you in a minute. So asking this question, I wanted to generate a description and explain how the COVID pandemic uh, impacted midwifery services in GTA and Lima Metropolitana, and I also understand why of those impacts. So why it happened like it did. So based on the empirical literature, I identify three main questions, and these are highlighted here. The first one um, talks about or focus on the effects of the health system components on coverage of health system framework. We talks about um, accessibility and availability. And the second one, um, also is based, oh, sorry, is based on the quality of maternal and newborn care uh, framework to determine specifically about the values and the philosophy of birth, meaning communication, their relationship we have with our clients, informed choice discussion. If those um, sub themes were also uh, impacted by COVID. And third, um, I was wondering why those impacts happen like that. And 
And for that, I'm using the theoretical framework uh, of political and health system factors that influence the role of midwives within the health system. Um, so these are not necessarily theory, theoretical ideas that I'm implementing into the research per se, but they're more guidance. As, as I explained at the beginning, research um, helps you to go everywhere and everywhere could be infinite. So these frameworks help me to set the tone and then and then go from there, especially in, in terms of developing my uh, instrument for data collection. And then, but I couldn't separate myself from my research. And the lenses that I'm coming from are so diverse. And then I also wanted to make sure that I was protecting the, the people or the, the persons that I was going or trying to involve into my study. So first of all, I, I'm looking this information within the lenses of intersectionality, highlighting that there is multiple intersecting um, socialist categories, and then there are so many interlocking systems of oppression, and that might affect the, the life of individuals that are part in this study. And I also was aware of using a language to frame the questions and ensure participants um, that they had the rights to decide what they wanted to answer, and also um, being aware of some sign of uh, symptoms of trauma that will be pre um, that will appear over our conversations and making sure also that um, I knew how to react to it and then how to help them navigate looking for some resources, making also um, uh, being aware that I'm not an expert in mental health, but I um, but I but I had to get some, accountability about my own questions and how people are gonna to react to it. And then the post-colonial feminism came from my reflections on, specifically because I'm a Latino Asian person and the white feminism didn't seem to resonate necessarily with what, what I was looking for. And then how our, uh, our place in this world that is very driven by, by even the rights to vote and the rights to decide for an abortion are not necessarily uh, reflecting what we're looking as Latinos or as marginalized communities. <clears throat> and understanding also that the term feminism is not homogeneous and then it differs by where you're living and what your life experience is. So um, these are the theoretical frameworks that I was explaining at the beginning. And I don't know how, how I'm at with time, but this is kind of the map that I was using when I was uh, planning on my research. So this is my big question, my two small questions, and these are the frameworks that were helping me to develop my data instruments. And then identifying who I wanted to talk to. First of all, I wanted to talk with midwives, that's the healthcare providers. I wanted to talk also to service users, who was one of the most challenging things to do. And then, um, and also doing some data collection. And, and then I also included some key informants and uh, so I was able to talk to some middle field leaders. And this is the idea of the data collection. These are my two cases. Um, and the whole research, it's about this, this two countries. And then I'm not planning to do a comparison uh, study because the two countries are so different. The middle free stories are, or, or the middle free um, uh, system is very similar because I practice in Peru as well, but the context of the social structure, the health system is very different. But but it's interesting to see how middle free can be the same and different and different in 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 a, in a set of uh, in in the set of th these ideas. So I determined to have two units of analysis in each country. Um, and in some cases, I had to go up to three 
based on how difficult it was to reach to midwifery free uh, services uh, and also service users. And the data collection was one of the things that was one of the biggest adventures at this point, particularly because I'm doing this research in two countries with two different languages. Um, so my instruments had to be very specific in the language that I was using. So for example, for, can for Canada, asking questions about how you do I identify in your gender, it was kind of straightforward. But then when I was asking that question in Peruvian midwives, they were like, what do you even mean with that? Or why are you asking me those questions? And you can imagine also that kind of question uh, when I was talking to service users. One of the um, the things that I also learned about doing this global health research is that research in a Western country is very email-based and Zoom-based, whether in Peru, everything was, was WhatsApp. So all the all the interviews and most of that had to be on WhatsApp. And some of the service users in Peru really have very limited access to internet. And even um, uh, it, it's a very difficult circumstance that they are living in. And, and even for some then it's very, um, it's very dangerous to be outside their house. Uh, and then, and they work in the street markets during the day and they're gone back home at, at 11 p.m. So I ended up doing some research at even like 1 a.m. in the morning for some of the service users because they, they were working in the street markets. Um, so this is where I am. We're trying to be at the moment. I'm in the data analysis collection. And my analysis, it is using constructivist approach. And as uh, I'm also use, using some ideas of the grounded theory. Um, and I'm using actual 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 coding, sorry. And the stage, I'm in the stage one at the moment. I'm doing line by line open coding, and I'm going to go back into my data and then try to get more information. And at the end of my stage, so I'm using an analysis on one case first. I'm analyzing Canada first, and then analyzing through then, and then analyzing the whole context at the end. That's my stage two. So. Like when you see my slides, it seems like it's pretty like organized like this. And this is actually not that the reality. It's very messy. And then I have all this data and I have all these languages and then um, and I have all these beautiful stories. And then uh, and as I'm doing the research, more questions come and there's more interested, interested things that I, come into my mind and then I have to stop and they say, okay, you just focus on this first and then you can go back into, into the other. So this is where I am at the moment. And uh, uh, I don't have any results at this mom at this point. This is basically the journey I am going through. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. That was uh, really interesting exciting to see um, your learning just working across the two different countries and uh, models of midwifery. Um, so I'd just like to give people a few seconds to be able to type in your questions or comments for Susanna in the chat box or raise a hand or unmute yourself. And I also noticed that uh, there was a question in there. Eileen, thank you so much for dropping a question for Claire. What I will do is just so we can get through all the speakers' presentations, I'll hold this question and we have a QA uh, panel piece once everyone has had a chance to speak. So uh, we can definitely address that question there. I have a quick question. Oh, sorry, there you go. Oh, can no. I see the hand? And I did answer the question, but I made it a direct message. So I don't know how to copy and paste it into the main chat um, for Eileen. Um, but to then a quick question for you. Um, more this is more of a technical question of like how are you doing your line by line and co like co uh, phrase by phrase with the fact that you have like two languages like mm. are you just a quick insight of like wh what are you what's your approach so I'm doing at the moment analysis so as I'm doing the interviews I am doing analysis and reflecting memo while I'm talking to people and I don't try to translate really on my head 
So I'm just going by what I'm feeling and what I'm hearing. So I'm using in vivo for the data analysis. And when I'm doing the um, analysis for the Canadian content, and I have to say though, Canadian doesn't mean necessarily English speaking because I've been able to contact Spanish speaking service users in Canada, which were a totally different story and experience than talking to Peruvian service users. So um, I am honoring the language at this point. So when I'm do, you, doing the analyzing, the analysis, sorry, um, I'm doing line by line. So I'm going sentence by sentence. Sometimes that sentence belongs to different codes. And then I go back. I don't know, it's very erratic at the moment. And I'm even coding sometimes my own memories, like from what I understand from those lines. And I'm going back, which I feel is taking me the longest. I don't know if I'm doing it right or wrong, really. And I have an I have a meeting with my supervisor soon. Uh, but I don't know if that answers your question, but it's very like a cycle. You think that you're done and then you go back and uh, it's not very linear. And that I think that's the space when it's very um is very challenging, especially because in my case, this is my research. I don't have anyone to compare or reflect my my findings other than my supervisor. Uh, so I feel I'm relying a lot of my own interpretation, which is very biased. Um, so I think that's the hardest part for me. Like, is it actually what I'm reading or is that I'm making it to be like that? Thanks, uh, Susanna, for that. Okay, so um, I would like to now introduce our next speaker, uh, who's Momina Khan. Momina is a midwifery student from Toronto Metropolitan University who comes with a global perspective. Momina is committed to fostering inclusivity in healthcare, um, in healthcare advocating for significant policy changes to improve midwifery practices and health outcomes worldwide. Thank you, Momina. That's huge, by the way. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for joining us today. And a special thanks actually to Cam for providing us a platform to share our research. I think that's really valuable. Today, I'll be uh, sharing some preliminary findings from a study that we're conducting at TMU called At Home With Birth, Exploring Ontario Midwifery Program Graduates Perception of Home Birth and Home Birth Education. And I'm working alongside Mary Sharp, Vicki Van Wagner, and Manavi Handa. Uh, before I delve into the study itself, I'd like to just take a moment to reflect on my positionality as a researcher, as a racialized Muslim woman, and as a second year midwifery student. My lived experiences heavily shape the research that I conduct, especially in this study. Um, in a world that continues to overlook or misjudge people who look like me, I use research as a tool not just for academic pursuits, but also as a powerful and strategic tool to advocate for systemic changes. Um, although this study, unlike my peers, um, doesn't focus on like exclusively on people of color, Indigenous and Black folks, um, it is heavily shaped by a conscious effort to ensure that those voices are represented in this study. And it's essential to me actually that across all the research that, re research that I do or that I'm involved in, um, it reflects the diversity and richness of our communities that we're part of. It's actually interesting because when I first heard about home births, it, very like just last year when I started the MEP, I thought home birth doesn't apply to populations that look like me. It's not something that I'm interested in. Um, but actually, like the more that I do this research and the more that I'm learning about the benefits of home birth, I'm becoming, I'm becoming more and more um, invested in how to make this practice um, better and how to bring it back to populations that are overlooked and mistreated. I was actually surprised to learn of a US-based stat that showed that um, home birth actually increased amongst Black women by 36% in 2019 to 2020, and then it increased another 21% from 2021 to 2020, 2020 from 20 to 2021. And I know that these stats are during COVID, um, but this data really underscores the importance of research because research shows that community-based models and midwifery in particular, when it's serviced by racialized midw midwives, um, it's linked to improve maternal infant health outcomes, um, especially for those who are racialized and come from a lower income. So having said that, 
why did we do this study? So the College of Midwives of Ontario upholds a mandate that requires midwives to provide a choice of birthplace to their clients. This includes home, hospital, or where possible, a birth center. And the Ontario Midwifery Education Program aims to equip its students with the necessary skills to thrive in these variety of settings. Um, and a critical part of this is, of course, ensuring that midwives who are graduating are both confident and competent in facilitating home births. But we don't actually know how well the MEP is preparing graduates for this important part of our practice. Um, and so the real core question that's driving our study is we aim to uncover the real experiences of um, recent graduates to understand um, their preparedness for home birth and to, and to ultimately guide the enhancement of midwifery education. So, um, and this is actually really prevalent now because as you can see from the orange line, there's a declining rate of home births. And then um, a recent, the recent report by the AOM showed that there was actually a drop from 14% to 13% in the latest born data that was provided. So just a very quick overview of our methods because I want to spend most of my time providing just a small sliver of what our research showed. Uh, we recruited 74 midwives who graduated between 2018 to 2023. Just to give us a balance between pre-COVID and post-COVID, we recruited across all the MEPs in Ontario. As you can see from the breakdown of the identities, we really made a conscious effort to recruit midwives who come from diverse identities. Um, and then we distributed an online survey, and we also gave participants the opportunity to um, speak with us over a Zoom call if they wanted to expand on anything in the survey answers. So what I've done for this presentation, again, it was 74 participants. Anyone who's done qualitative research knows that that's a lot of people. I'm just going to be highlighting some uh, very quick barriers and facilitators, and then I'll end off with recommendations that were provided by our participants. I've, I've split up the barriers and facilitators to be course specific. Um, so like the courses that we do in the MEP, and then when we're in clinical placements. So the first uh, course specific barrier that came up dominantly was this reoccurring theme of how there's increased medicalization of birth, and that's also resulted in increased medicalization of home birth practice. And many midwives felt that this reality wasn't adequately addressed in our courses that we have in the MEP. So midwives were graduating and they weren't prepared for the numerous guidelines and the fragile hospital relationships that really needed to be managed, even when a physiological birth was being conducted at home. So one participant shared, I found the preclinical courses to be unrealistic, given we are bound by the public health care system and the college to administer a specific and limited set of procedures. The shortcoming of my education were in being profoundly misled about the capacity of registered midwives to truly give our clients choice and power as our top priority. From a working midwife's perspective, homework, home birth is now essentially the same as hospital birth in terms of having the college and your hospital breathing down your neck to fulfill your policies first and the client's choice second. Um, another related uh, course specific barrier that was mentioned by several participants was that they started to, like when they first started the MEP, they felt very good about conducting home birth, but then as they approached into their final year, there was more of a heavier emphasis on the complications and the things that can go wrong. And so they kind of graduated with this tinted image of what home birth is, and some of them even ended up developing a fear of it. So as one participant shared, we mostly discussed emergencies at home birth or assumed that if we are role playing an emergency that we're at home. And I think this impacted my perception and comfort with home birth. I became less um, comfortable with home births. So in terms of clinical placement specific barriers, um, there were several, but um, the main thing here that I wanted to stress on is that many participants shared that the clinics that they did their clinical placement at had a significant influence with their comfort uh, with conducting home birth. And unfortunately, there were several participants who were at clinics that had preceptors that had a negative bias towards home birth. So as one participant shared, my preceptor did not support home birth. She thought it was dangerous and risky. Any clients who were planning home birth were risked, were risked out in the third trimester. And this was just not her. It was a practice protocol. And so by the same token, um, many, many participants were also in a practice that had a low home, out of home birth rate. And that acted as a barrier because then students weren't able to get that hands-on experience, which was really rated as that top factor that helped in developing that confidence and competence to, do, to um, delivering home birth. 
So those are just some very quick barriers. I'm sorry if I'm talking too fast. I'm trying to get through everything in good time, but <laughs> I hope it's I hope it's clear. So in terms of facilitators, um, again, there was core specific facilitators that enhance competence and competence. Um, several midwives really appreciated learning about the safety of home birth through peer reviewed articles early on in the MEP. As one participant shared, I remember that the early years of the program normalized home birth for me in a way that was rooted in the foundational midwifery belief of choice of birthplace, the focus on the positive and the safe outcomes of home birth attended, midwife attended home birth made me feel confident with the concept of home birth when going into my first clinical placement, even if I did not have the skills to manage them. Um, another clinical placement specific facilitator, which kind of goes off of the barrier, which is that when you had preceptors that were confident with conducting home birth and you were placed in clinics that promote it, it really helped with confidence. So as one participant shared, um, my preceptor had thorough ICDs about home birth, had high out-of-hospital birth rates, and very much thrived in older practice with a reputation for out-of-hospital birth. They supported choice as much as possible and were able to discuss transfer in a way that did not come from a place of fear. And so as my first exposure to clinical practice, it really shaped the way I viewed midwifery and how I wanted to practice in the future. And it wasn't just observing um, these preceptors. Participants also shared the positive impact of having a preceptor that provided them additional educational opportunities for home birth, like setting up and refilling the birth bag. Um, and even when their clinic didn't have a high out-of-hospital out of rate, these preceptors would provide exposure to unmed unmedicated physiological birth, which was key. And then they also talked about scenarios of how situations would look like if it were to be a home birth. So that really helps students to become more um, comfortable with the idea of home birth. And then another important um, clinical placement specific facilitator was having the opportunity to work in low intervention and rural settings where there's a higher tolerance to staying at home instead of transferring into the hospital. And so this included working with Amish populations, indigenous populations, some midwives in their third year were able to do international placements, and that served as a very valuable opportunity to grow in their skill set. Um, as one participant shared, in my third year, I completed a placement in a low resource birth center. All births were unmedicated, mostly uncomplicated, um, and I still look back on this time and draw from these experiences with massive amounts of gratitude. So those are just some um, very brief barriers and facilitators that were dominantly mentioned throughout all throughout many participants. In our surveys, we also asked the participants to give us recommendations on how we can improve the MEP to better build that confidence and competence. The first um, that was very prevalent was that we need more integration of home birth preparation and, and execution in the curriculum. So beyond just like the emergency skills workshop and the NRP, we need to integrate home birth into all our courses, even courses like anatomy and physiology so that we can really learn about how our bodies are designed to do certain things. A second thing that was brought up um, across many participants is the value of having simulations for preparing for home births. Um, and this is particularly relevant where clinical opportunities are limited. So many participants shared that Although it might not help as much with confidence because, you know, in a home birth or in any birth, anything can really happen, but at least they know that they had the competence to do certain skills and drills that are needed. And then last but not least, a lot of students really valued learning from experienced midwives and clients through things like storytelling, uh, mentorship, like mentor-led workshops, and then having debriefs. So many participants shared and just hearing their stories made me really happy because I've actually never been to a home birth myself. Um, many participants shared how when their preceptor told them about a story or when their professors and classes told them about a story, it really stuck with them into their practice and really, you know, encouraged them to talk more about home birth with their clients when they became registered midwives. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And I'd like to thank our funders, um, the SSHRC, for funding the study. Thank you. Thank you, Momina. That was a great presentation. <laughs> ah, thank you. And just quickly going through the chat box. Uh, there's a question from Mimi. Um, Mamina, there's a question in the chat box for you. Uh, it's the question is was was there any consideration for building community care models, including doulas and other birth workers who can help support home birth? <laughs> 
Now, that's a great question. It didn't come up in our in our surveys or our interviews because I think we were like more focused on the MEP itself, right? But I'm sure um, if we had prompted or asked questions about like midwives who are like new registrants or have been working, that might have come up. So no, I didn't, unfortunately, but I'm sure it's something that is very valuable from your experience as a doula, for sure. <laughs> Great. And just a reminder, if uh, you think of questions afterwards, still pop them into the chat box because we will have that Q&A period at the end. Okay. Thank you. So if there's nothing else from Amina, um, the, our next speaker is Trish, uh, Trish Langley from Pong. And Trish is a passionate registered midwife and graduate student in Ontario. Trisha's research aims to enhance the educational experience for racialized students, contributing significantly to the sustainability of midwifery and a more inclusive healthcare environment. Over to you, Trish. Thank you. Uh, Bumi's going to help me out with the slides. Um, so hopefully we will do a dance and coordinate ourselves together. Um, thank you for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for taking some of your time out this afternoon to be with us. I'm also really excited to share this and I'll be honest, a bit nervous um, in the sense that this is Black History Month and we're nearing the end of this. And this, I feel like, is a great way for us to share our experiences, celebrate our excellence together. So I want to thank you for that. Um, we can go to the next slide. You'll have a quick sense of what my agenda is. We're not going to stay in here long. Um, and uh, we can go to the next slide where I want to start our my presentation with a land acknowledgement first. I'm joining you while living and working on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, namely the Odawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwa people. It's also the land on which the Miki Treaty of 1790 was signed, involving the Odawa, Potawatomi, and Chippewa and Huron Nations living in the Detroit area, as well as the counties of Essex, Kent, Elgin, Middlesex, and Lambton. I recognize and honor the Indigenous peoples as the original stewards of this land. I also acknowledge the significant historical and current contributions of Indigenous peoples to the diverse fabric of our community our community, our country, and our world. And I endeavor to do my part to engage respectfully and mindfully with the work that uplifts and support indigenous communities. So with the next slide, it kind of gives a sense of what has inspired or motivated some of my research. Um, I felt like putting my social locations, if you will, in a different format um, and kind of what is the lens or some of the lens by which I came to my research. The first is um, my lived experience. I am a Black woman. I have had to often navigate predominantly white spaces, both in learning and working environments, many of which felt unsafe uh, with a daily onslaught of microaggressions. I'm also a mom to two Black girls, as you can see from the picture there, born into the hands of midwives at home. I also reflect upon my personal experiences within the midwifery education program, including being, as part of my alma mater, the only Black uh, black graduate in my cohort of 2020, um, which felt quite jarring to me considering where we were at and our uh, history of midwifery in its current context. And each of these experiences, plus many more, as well as disclosures from friends, colleagues, classmates, students that I've been precepting, have encouraged this curiosity and understanding the experiences of epoch and racialized midwives and racialized learners. Um, I'm also engaged, if you will, in various committee work and locally, provincially, and nationally, and it's allowed me to connect with many other people who um, have identified, examined, and are fighting to dismantle the impacts of systemic racism and white supremacy. I also was part of a project uh, where I co-created, co-directed, and hosted the Black Births Matter series with my, the founder of the Black Birth, or sorry, the Birth Talks podcast, and that's an image that you'll see there, the second picture, and it was through engaging in this uh, project on the podcast that I began to consider how research has been weaponized, but also accessed as a tool for advocacy, and then I started to wonder my place within all of that. And then my personal learning. In my adulthood, I began to find literature that identified and called out systemic racism and white supremacy while also demanded change. And while studying through my first degree, I could only confidently name over and blatant forms of racism, but that changed over time. 
And I, I began to form a more critical eye and a confidence in speaking up and out. The seminal work of Faye Nasefa, alongside her co-authors Luan Mahari, Father Magur, and Dr. Loy Wiley, sparked within me the nerve to speak out about what we have known and experienced in racialized folk in the midwifery education program. Part of their research identified that racialized and epoch midwives and midwifery students had experienced and witnessed racism and racist acts. Another article that influenced my interest in research uh, is the work of Tuka Shamke with her co-authors, Claire Ram Logan Salanga and Dr. Liz Darling. And their work explored racialized students' experiences with resilience. Both of these articles, along with many others uh, that I encountered, uh, create a desire to engage in academic research that would look at Canadian midwifery and where the experiences of racialized and IPOC midwives and midwifery students would fall within that. So my research question, I will be honest, it looks a lot different from when I started this process a year ago and reflecting. I work alongside with my thesis supervisor to determine its usefulness, its appropriateness. So it's possible that in a couple of weeks, the next time I meet with my supervisor, it may look a bit different. But in its current iteration, iteration, it is what is the experience of psychological and cultural safety for midwifery students who self-identify as Black, Indigenous, or a person of color, IPOC, or BIPOC, in clinical placements. And with that, I have five objectives. You can go to the next slide, Boonmi. And again, working alongside with my thesis supervisor, that it can be modified. My hope is to investigate and understand the contributing factors to psychological safety in midwifery clinical setting. My hope is to investigate and understand the cultural aspects influencing the sense of safety for racialized and IPOC midwifery students, to identify challenges or barriers faced by racialized and IPOC midwifery students in achieving psychological and cultural safety, to examine the impact of the clinical environment, peer interactions and preceptor relationships on the experiences of IPOC and racialized midwifery students, and finally to gather recommendations basically to enhance psychological and cultural safety. And so part of that, we can go to the next slide, um, is comes from also and informed by some of my literature review. I use the Sinhal Medline and Embase databases to do my initial literature review and use the search terms midwifery, midwifery student, midwifery education, midwifery student experiences, clinical placement, psychological safety, and cultural safety. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, we know from the literature that there is a growing recognition of the importance of psychological and cultural safety. Psychological safety refers to an individual's perception of safety within a particular environment where they feel comfortable expressing themselves, taking risk, and being vulnerable without fear of negative consequences. Cultural safety, which originated from Indigenous healthcare practices in New Zealand and has since been adopted in other contexts globally, emphasizes the need for environments that respect and validate diverse cultural identities and perspectives. The research on psychological safety has predominantly emerged from management and organizational psychological or psychology literature, rather. While the majority of the articles I reviewed did not explicitly identify the term psychological safety as part of the learning experience, speaking of it in a medical clinical uh, situation, they did use phrases like an environment conducive to learning is optimum for the student and their learning opportunities. So it's a bit of like coded phrase language rather than explicitly using the term psychological safety. Other things that may have been used are like using the language need for nurturing and safe environment. Again, not explicitly stating psychological safety, but you can kind of gather and make some broad assumptions about the language. Cultural safety involves acknowledging power imbalances, addressing systemic inequities, and promoting cultural competent practices. Even though there is a gap of knowledge from what I've gathered that is directly related to my research project, there is a well-demonstrated link between improved health outcomes for marginalized and racialized populations, which results in increased trust in their care providers. The intersection of psychological and cultural safety recognizes that psychological well-being and cultural identity influences an individual sense of safety. And I found this quote that I felt has sort of captured some of what I was hoping to explore within my research. Effective learning can only be achieved if the learner feels safe and accepted under the supervision of the clinician. And there is a reason here that I believe that we can surmise that a person may feel psychologically safe in an environment where there's cultural identity is, is invalidated or marginalized. Additionally, cultural safety cannot be achieved without addressing psychological safety aspects like trust, respect, and autonomy. 
So with the next slide, you'll be able to see my next steps. It's pretty consistent with existing research models. I will be honest and say that my literature review is a bit in a reflexive sort of state. I'm going back and forth, gathering more information and in intel, um, and I feel comfortable with that right now. Um, and I continue to explore various databases to gather information. Um, I hope to use a qualitative methodological approach to engage with midwifery students to understand their experiences. And while I'm working towards obtaining ethics approval, I will be creating a list of well thought out questions as part of my data collection process, hoping to use focus groups as well as member check ins, which I believe Claire had said that she was, I think it was Claire that was saying she was doing something similar as a way to engage with the material. Um, in conclusion, we can totally go to the next slide. Um, in the early stages of this investigation, the research suggests that promoting psychological and cultural safety are tools to create an inclusive environment. As such, those efforts should be made to extend to that um, extend that to midwifery clinical placements. And it's not to say it's not happening. We just don't have the data right now to suggest that it is happening or that it's not happening. Um, so through my research and working towards my objectives, understanding the experiences of psychological and cultural safety in a clinical learning environment of racialized and epoch midwifery students, I hope it will facilitate the opportunity for inclusive environments that supports the diverse needs of student learners. And the last slide just has some references. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Uh, I'd like to open the floor for any questions or comments for Trish about her presentation. Um, it's Eileen. I just have a quick question for Trish. With your, I know you're in the early stages of your research and you're looking at psychological safety and cultural safety. Are you going to be able to attain um, data regarding, say, areas where people of color, IBOC, BIPOC, are actually feeling culturally safe. So um, looking at maybe even uh, the, the uh, you know, practices were more heavily indigenous or, or um, more, more diverse to see if there's anything there that gives you more uh, um, not knowledge about what is cultural and psychological safety for, for, pro for programs that are actually working. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm hoping that um, I'm hoping that my research will pull not just barriers and challenges, but also what's working and what's working well, and mm. get a sense of why it's working. Whether it's from and and it because it's all student experiences, it will be their perception of what they may say about their clinic environment or their preceptor relationships or their hospital environment. But my hope is is not just all the hard stuff and the barriers and the challenges, but also what's working and, and that hopefully will inform the recommendations um, mm -hmm. that we'll gather for my research. Right. I hope that answers your question, Eileen. Yes, it does. Thanks for that, Eileen. Okay, so if there are no further questions or comments for Trish, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker who is uh, Minnie Quay, uh, sorry, Minnie, can you please uh, correct me if I'm mispronouncing your last name? Pardon me? Qua. All right. Sorry about that. Um, and Minnie is a midwifery student at Toronto Metropolitan University and a director at Amani Birth. Her research is on modesty uh, rights and the impacts of Islamophobia on the healthcare experiences of Muslim families. My slides. Yep, we can see your slides. So I kind of regret going last. I feel like a total newbie fangirling all the other speakers <laughs> who have done way more research than I have. I'm sort of on this beginning of my journey. And so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land where I live in the region of Peel. It's part of the treaty lands of the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, traditionally the territory of the Anishinaabeg, Huron Wendat. Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, homes of Métis, and most recently the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, land that the Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for and continue to do so today. And I also like to thank CAM for organizing and hosting this session. I feel really grateful and honored to be part of this event. 
So this is just very quickly a brief agenda. I'll be situating myself, talk about why I'm interested in research, what I've already written on the right to modesty in perinatal care, and also very briefly touch on the perinatal care experiences and outcomes of South Asian women, which I'm also interested in researching and share some final thoughts on this journey. So situating myself, these are sort of representations of myself over the years. Um, I'm from East and Southeast Asian heritage. I actually found a, a, a little uh, icon here, or image of someone wearing ao yai, it's like a traditional Vietnamese dress, which was cool. I'm born in the US to refugee parents. So I've had that kind of immigrant refugee experience growing up. I embraced Islam at the age of 22. So I was already an adult. And so I experienced time being covered and uncovered. I've worn the hijab. I've also worn the niqab, the face veil, uh, for 13 years. So I've actually spent more years with my face covered than uncovered. Um, and after um, you know moving to Canada, I decided not to wear the niqab. But ironically, I did wear it during the COVID mask mandate because it was more comfortable than the regular mask. So I've experienced healthcare as a racialized person. I've given birth four times. Um, and I've experienced healthcare as an uncovered and covered person. So I've, I've seen the difference of how people are treated, you know, being a covered person, uncovered person. So wearing hijab or not. And as a birth worker, I'm a doula and childbirth educator. I've supported many racialized and Muslim clients. Uh, and I've seen how they've experienced those spaces as well. So why research? Coming into the MEP, uh, I've taken the social justice course, was, course, which is a full year course, and also the introduction to midwifery course. And I found that there were no readings at all about Islamophobia or Muslim experiences in perinatal care, which is pretty alarming considering that there's so many clients who are from Muslim backgrounds and also just uh, religious minority backgrounds as well. Here in Brampton, there's a huge South Asian community and the majority of them are from uh, minority religious backgrounds. There's very little to no coverage of issues pertaining to the Asian community, anti-Asian racism, cultural safety for specifically Asian clients who experience racism in a different way than um, our other uh, BIPOC uh, family. So furthermore, there's uh, very little, um, uh, I guess, data coming from the actual clients who are not feeling safe in the healthcare setting. So on the ground, I'm hearing issues around concerns for modesty and privacy cultural and spiritual practices and feeling coercion or being shamed into accepting interventions. So these are some common concerns I'm hearing from act actual clients, but I'm not seeing addressed in our curriculum. There's a lack of literature centered on Muslim Asian voices, as I mentioned, and I'm really interested in, you know, building a knowledge base to inform clients and practitioners, shape uh, healthcare provider training and impact systemic issues. Uh, so coming from an education background, I have a master's in education that I really wanted to sort of help build this knowledge base. So one area I'm interested in is the right to modesty and perinatal care. I already have a paper written and I've been encouraged to get it published. So I have to sort of rewrite, edit it, hopefully. And um, there are some literature articles out there that discuss these issues, but it's not enough. And often it's very superficial, usually from an outsider perspective. And usually it's based on a cultural competency or sensitivity lens and not based on social justice, examining systemic anti-Muslim discrimination, racism, or societal Islamophobia. So I want to kind of focus more on the cultural safety, social justice, and human right lenses in approaching these issues. And just some data to show why this is important. Um, so this is, this is all from Statistics Canada. So anti-Muslim hate crimes and gender Islamophobia we see that 47% of hate crimes against Muslims are against women and girls. And this is the largest number compared to all other targeted groups with indigenous women and girls following uh, behind but at 45%. Muslim women and girls are targeted because they wear head coverings. So they're more visible because of that. And 73% of Muslim women and girls in Canada wear head coverings. And also looking at intersectionality of race or ethnicity and religion and other identities, 88% of Muslims in Canada are from visible minority groups as well. And finally, this is covered by people's cameras here, so let's move it. Um, Islamophobia and racism transfers into healthcare settings. Although in Canada, we don't have data about this. In the US, the data shows that Muslim women experience probably one of the highest levels of religious and racial discrimination, even compared to all other racial, uh, racialized, uh, sorry, women groups. So 
So some highlights from what I want to focus on in my research and in my paper is to explore the significance of modest practices to the people who actually follow it. So highlighting spiritual, religious, cultural values and community defined needs. I also want to take a look at um, Eurocentric colonialist knowledge hierarchy shape, how it shapes normative culture, which treats modesty as abnormal, unimportant and backwards. So this is just a quote from the paper that I've written. Societal and a systemic Islamophobia may influence healthcare workers within the medical system to perpetuate the stereotype that Muslim women who cover are inferior, backward, and oppressed. This can lead to disrespect, misunderstandings, or inappropriate value judgments about why people cover and place importance on modesty to a disregard for or deprioritization of their need for gender concordant care and to an overall inability or inadequacy of the system to provide cultural and spiritual safety to a potentially significant portion of the birthing population. And something I wanna look into in future research is to look at structures, procedures, and resources and how this makes uh, Muslim women and other women who value modesty, other birth pe birthing people who value modesty feel unsafe, to identify practical areas for potential changes and improvements to create a more humanizing and respectful care experience. And so something really, really important that I wanna do is help change the narrative about people who cover. And I think encouraging narratives um, about women wearing head coverings as a form of res resi resilience and resistance may help combat Islamophobia and other forms of discrimination. And so another quote from the paper, the choice to practice modesty in public can be seen positively as a form of resistance and spiritual empowerment for many women as it is a way that they disrupt the public gaze on their bodies, exert agency in protecting their physical privacy, even if it is seen as abnormal, and they show courage and resiliency to open, ident openly identify as people of faith, belief, and traditional practice, even in the face of public hospi hostility and systemic discrimination, recognizing that it takes strength of character, courage, and commitment to observe and preserve traditional practices of modesty in a society that devalues the traditions of marginalized people may help redirect the narrative of modestly covered women as people needing to be liberated to people who should be respected and celebrated as keepers and protectors of traditional knowledge, practices, and spiritual identity. And just quickly to touch on another subject that I wanna research in the future, I have a literature review written on this, but I'm just gonna go very quickly. Uh, there's a disproportionate rate of fetal distress and stillbirth globally for um, people of South Asian background. And they're often subjected to routine, routine early induction of labor and cesarean sections. And this is globally, I've spoken to birth workers and clients all around the globe from South Asian backgrounds and their experiences experiencing this in the medical system wherever they live. Um, I'm concerned about the pathology of race and ethnicity rather than addressing root causes such as social determinants of health. And I found that recently from clients, I've heard that there are recommendations targeting South Asian clients in Canada using data based from other countries, but ignoring racial disparities and inequity, inequities locally. So more research is necessary to understand the needs of clients from South Asian backgrounds in Canada. And so some final thoughts of getting started into research. Um, I've definitely been motivated by the lack of literature when I was doing a preliminary review of these topics. And that pushed me into sort of writing and um, looking into what's out there. As a birth worker, working with clients on the ground, I feel there's an urgent community need in both of these areas that I'm interested in uh, to get the information out there to the care providers so that clients can have a safer um, experience. And I also feel like there's this, um, I guess as a BIPOC person, as a racialized person to make visible the invisible I was really inspired by Dr. Karen Lawford. She's an indigenous uh, researcher who's won many awards who talked about invisible policies. And I feel like a lot of invisible policies apply to Muslim and Asian people because there's a lot of racial um, biases that occur but are not really overt. A lot of it is quite subtle. And a lot of times the community can't even quite put their finger on what's wrong, but they don't feel safe. And so I hope my research in the future can build a foundation for a body of knowledge that centers prioritizes and values the Muslim and Asian experience and voices. So thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Rini. Um, 
Yeah, it's uh, a topic that we don't often hear about in midwifery. So I really do thank you for um, exploring that and bringing it to our attention. I have to say, I particularly um, really loved your slide around changing the narrative. I think you so powerfully articulated uh, what the hijab represents for many Muslim women. So thank you for doing that. Any questions or comments for Minnie? And you have a comment uh, in the chat box. 100% uh, agree based on some Australian study. There has been a big push for induction of labors for South Asian women. All right, so if we don't have any questions or comments for Minnie, then I will move us along to the question and answer panel. Um, we want to thank all the speakers uh, for your presentations today. Uh, and so we'll transition to this final segment of today's showcase uh, with our esteemed panelists, Momina, Claire, and Trish. So over the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes, we'll delve into an engaging discussion where you'll have the opportunity to ask our panelists about their academic journey, their research interests and experiences in the field. But before we dive into that, let's begin with a round table introduction so that we can hear a bit more uh, from each of them. And you have some comments saying, well done. <laughs> All right, so let's maybe start from uh, with Numina, if there's any sort of additional introductions that you'd like to share with the group about yourself, your research. Um, all right, so a little bit about my research. Um, I have worked in several different uh, countries, including Kenya and India and Canada broadly, uh, working with several different populations. I think my, my research working with disabled populations in particular in Ontario is what led me to midwifery. So when I was doing my master's in public health at U of T, um, I was speaking to a lot of uh, people who had disabilities and they started speaking so highly of their midwives. And I was like, what's a midwife? Like, I never heard of that before. Um, and that's actually what led me to midwifery. And so I'm hoping to keep that going and keeping that positive narrative around midwifery, you know, growing it in our public, in our public sphere and really getting midwives to be more confident and competent in their skills so that we, you know, you know, the, the importance of our work is really highlighted uh, more globally and locally. So that's a little bit about like what my research aims to do currently. I'm working with quite quite a few amazing folks. I feel I'm only in my second year of my midwifery schooling, but I'm getting to work with people like Manavi, working with uninsured populations, working on this study about home birth, um, working with um, Beth at McMaster to see um, things like what they're exploring. And so it's been really eye-opening to see all these different um, studies that are being done in midwifery for sure. Thank you for that, Marina. Uh, and Claire, any additional sort of bits of information you'd like to share with the group? Yeah. Um, uh, um, I'm just thinking right now. Um, so uh, I kind of just got into um research I say sort of like I kind of stumbled into all of this and where I've landed up is kind of I don't want to throw it to the wind like things I feel are very purposeful they happen and um I started off with um doing a master's program got into uh writing a thesis had no idea how to do that felt like uh, I'll just try and figure this thing out stumbled into that got into a few other projects with folks um, Trish mentioned one with um, Tuka Shemke, worked on that project, and I've just sort of been slowly chipping away and chipping away at building um, building projects, um, tapping shoulders to, to kind of stick my nose in and say, hey, can I just tap tag along? Like, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but I think I do. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Um, and that's really what kind of built some of my skills. Um, I also, you know, do work at the college. And that has been another kind of place of knowledge learning um, and also leadership skills and learning how to uh, be okay with like ruffling feathers um, and just 
doing things differently because it just feels like the right way to do things, whether that was my cultural influence or just the shift in the narrative of like, we don't have to do things one way and only one way. Um, and sort of that's that's where I'm at. And I'm so happy, Minnie, with the work that you're doing. Everybody really for our social justice course as well. Um, well, Mina, your piece of just talking about like, how do we make social justice actually re a real thing um, for first year students who have like very little to com um, compare to yet, like all preclinical. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to your work and that's kind of a little bit more about me. Claire uh, and anything Trish you'd like to share um when I was thinking about this question I well I, I I just have a hard time kind of explaining where I'm at and how I got here because I feel like so many of the people I know who are midwives it's a bit of an eclectic sort of hodgepodge journey it's not straightforward Sometimes you're kind of voluntold or you kind of show that you have a little bit of a strength. So you get pulled into something else and then all of a sudden you're pulled into something else. And then you realize you've, that you're actually doing the thing that you didn't think you could do. Um, but I, it sounds really cheesy to say, but my research journey really began as a child in, in the eighties. Like my mother had a bigger book collection than I did. It was pretty ridiculous. Um, and she was a nurse, so she had a lot of nursing textbooks. And I just like dived in from being like three and four and eight years old and just kind of, even if I couldn't understand the content, I was very curious about the content. Um, and I always knew I wanted to do graduate studies and research, but prior to even being in my undergrad, but I didn't know in what, like I didn't, I needed it to mean something. I needed to be purposeful. I just didn't want to get letters behind my name. Um, and it was really being a, a midwife, then seeing the gaps, because I always felt like I could never see the gaps. I never knew what questions to ask. And my experiences uh, within the MEP and being a midwife, precepting students that just gravitated, I guess, if you will, to finding the program and finding the graduate degree and, you know, I feel like I, I don't really understand research, but I kind of understand research. It's more about fine tuning the skill, well, finding the skills first and then fine tuning the skills. Um, and I'm just excited about it because I feel like the work isn't about me as much. I don't know, that can kind of sound cheesy, but it feels like I'm doing it for a reason. Like there's a why behind it. There's a humility behind it of you know, you have to learn, you have to check and balance. You Sometimes you stumble, sometimes you make mistakes, sometimes it's awkward. Um, but I'm really inspired by creating safe spaces for BIPOC, BIPOC people. It's really important to me that their voices are heard. It's really important to me that we are building the skills and supporting future generations of midwives. And I, I really actually enjoy being part of the conversations that create change, hence the podcast that I did a few years ago and working on again currently. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just excited to be part of the work. Thanks, Trish. And you've got some comments in there about that uh, book collection. I'm always amazed to see how color coordinated and organized that looks, very impressive. <laughs> Um, any questions or comments for our speakers? Carlene, you've got your hands up. Hi, sorry, I'm running in and out of meetings here. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to pose, and I guess I'm just sort of being the devil's advocate here, opening a Pandora's box. Um, many professions, um, our Toronto School Board, um, uh, many organizations in, in the public as well as in the private sector, when it's time for a value change or um, a change that's going to involve a real um, dangerous, risky shift in the culture of an organization, they have facilitators come in and they actually, you know, talk about all of their fears, all of their um, concerns, and then they start to test and challenge themselves. Um, some of it might involve role play. Some of it might involve um, just transparency about how frightened they feel and how to um, quiet that fear that they're experiencing, that almost somatic physiological fear. 
Um, and that's actually what we're working against in many of these midwifery practice groups. In any of the research that you've done, have you looked in your literature search at what that would mean for midwifery? I know that CAM has been taking that step. I know that AOM has taken that step. How can that step be taken um, in our MEP spaces, in our clinics, in our way of training preceptors? Um, just wondered if anyone had any ideas, because I'm I'm always looking for ideas and solutions. I'm I'm very aware of the problem. I feel it. I walk through it. I live through it every day. But I'm I'm so open to hearing about something that's new and and radical that helps us get out of our comfort zone. Feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, whoever is ready to take on Carlene's question. I think it's a hard one, Carlene. Like you're asking a good question. I think the silence just means like we don't know yet, right? We don't know how to um challenge those things or i i don't i don't want to say we don't know how it's like what is the mechanism that actually works you know it's interesting sometimes an outsider will come into a situation and they'll see it and they'll say wow there's a fire in this room didn't y'all know there was a fire in this room it's hot in here Wh why aren't you leaving why aren't you putting the fire out what's going on guys and actually use humor and be brash. And um, because those of us who are in the frying pan, we've been in the frying pan when it was on low heat and it gradually increased. And now it's at broiling and we're still in the frying pan. You know the story of the frog, right? <laughs> yeah. For, for myself, Carlene, I... I don't mean it in a facetiously facetious way, but I often think that we just have to actually burn the system, <laughs> burn the system down and, and start over. But the problem is, is that our systems, like there's other systems that are dependent on this particular system. So we have to tease away at it piece by piece. But then I feel like white supremacy and racism is a sneaky, sneaky thing that can be hiding in plain sight and embedded into the very fabric and it can shift and change and morph. So it's really hard to say, burn the system down. That's easy, but we actually know that there's so much dependent and reliant upon the system that we can't just actually burn it down without having massive Im impact and, and ripple effect on others. Um, but that is my actual wishful answer, knowing that that isn't the mm. most ideal. It is radical, but it's, not necessarily the radical that's going to work. Because, yeah. you know, I wonder, do policies guide us? Do they constrain us? Do they help us? Do they remind us? If there is a policy for us all to have required continuing education on, you know, cultural humility, and if it wasn't just, you know, putting in our, our one hour or two hour continuing education, if it was required, like NRP is required, could that be a motivator? Or if there was someone to help us enforce workplace and labor laws, would that be a motivator? I mean, it's a negative motivator. It's the stick instead of the carrot. I don't know what other kind of um, motivators there might be. Um, and I, I speak from a broken history of trying to motivate with both the stick and the carrot in the United States. And we have a very different, um, you know, professional organization in the United States than what we had 30 years ago, um, but uh, there's still a long way to go. And we had to have an outsider come in and tell the professional, the national professional organization, you know, straighten up and fly right. Um, I don't know. Is it okay, like Oh, sorry, Stana. You can go. Uh, I don't know if this is an answer or not or a comment. And then I'm speaking from a position that um, uh, where I am, uh, I be meeting with midwives and doulas who have been working in South America for humanizing birth, 
for so many years. It's been 30 years now. And one of the comments that um, that I learned from actually an organization in Peru is that one of the indigenous uh, uh, leaders asked the people in power to come to an event. They were going to discuss about policies and laws and birth and humanization and cesarean section and everything. But then strategically, they invited this person to do a workshop, but it was not a workshop about learning stuff. It was a workshop about doing stuff and not doing stuff about academic things, but doing an internal reflection on the, what they are on earth in this blog without their titles. They are not doctors, they're not lawyers or nothing. They, they just want them to analyze who they are. And that because this was about midwifery, they wanted them to understand what birth meant to them as human beings. So this indigenous midwife asked them to simulate the birth date. So um, they asked the, the uh, two, three people to work in three people to work in groups. So one was the fetus that was being birthed, and the others was the delivery person, and the other was a support person. So they were trying them to, um, I don't to delve into that idea. And they, and then this other person who was in the workshop told me that the president or the person who was the more in power, the one, a male, you, you can imagine like the male power, white person, the person who writes the law started crying and then saying that he didn't know what it was, but he knew that his birth was traumatic. So from that point, the conversation was open because they all understood that they were all human beings. And then there was one thing that they agree on, that every person should be born in peace and respected and that. So with one thing, they started the conversation. I'm not saying that this will change the whole system, but it helped them to realize that they with all the discrepancies they had, all the lenses that they had, they agreed on one thing and they started to reflect on what it was. It was, they were fighting for the same idea. And then of course it's gonna take so much time, but that's one of the questions I asked there at the beginning, like how much a workshop will do when we don't change our own history in our minds and like what we learn over years and then because this is a systemic issue and then, and it perpetrates like, um, so I'm excited to hear like, what are the outcomes of the research that we're doing? But I also reflect on, we are in a position of privilege and we're talking from the clients or the people that we are researching on, right? So, and then, um, and then that's where I feel that research for me, it's a very delicate privilege because I'm, and then I said like, how much is the data on me and how much is from other people? And that it talks to um, this change, but there is no change, it's, it's only one person doing it. And then um, the collect, it, it has to be on a personal reflection, but also that personal reflection has to be able to extrapolate to other people. So, um, is burning the system, but not in anger, but actually in, in compassion, in compassion and love, and then um, and then finding those agreements and to what we are fighting for. I don't know if it makes any sense or not, but that's I I found that workshop that she was discussing this person very powerful, and then how it was able to open a discussion. Thank you for that. I was just giving a pause in case if anyone had anything else to add. And um, I may add <laughs> my thoughts about uh, your question, Carleen, which is a, you know, it's, it's such an important and interesting question uh, around are policies effective in bringing change? And I find it particularly interesting in the work that we've been doing at the AOM and looking at our policies uh, 
but I mean, it's, I think it really speaks to the fact that it is a, why sessions like this today are really, really important, why focusing on uh, building EPOC um, excellence and, and leadership amongst EPOC is so incredibly important because when we look at policies at the end of the day, it's hard to make, um, you know, really radical changes in policies themselves if the right people are not behind those policies because policies need to go through organizational processes and sometimes they're worded the way we want it to be and other times they're worded the way the organization needs them to be. So, you know, I think this is why it's so important to, to build ourselves because really the most effective changes will come when we're making those changes from within not from outside of these spaces. And, you know, um, Trish, you spoke about, you know, of course, the easy answer is like, burn it all and start over again, right? Uh, and of course, you, you know, identified that it isn't that straightforward. And, and it isn't because, you know, for a few reasons, when we, we need to ensure that we have the people who can start it over in terms of have the knowledge base so that when we do start it over, it's, or whatever that is, I'm not saying burning it down right now, but it's, to start it over, we want to make sure that we have those fundamental like structures in place that will build a healthy, thriving system, right? And um, so, yes, yeah, so, and I think this strategic approach and and um, building on on epoch uh, excellence is is so much needed. But any other um, thoughts, comments? <laughs> for, for, I, I do have one question, and it's a very selfish question. This is a very difficult time in the world. We're overcoming pa the pandemic. Any second now, many of our children, especially if they're our grandchildren, are feeling as though someone can press a button and we could all be blown up any second. What can the um, what can the MEP do? And I'm asking for everyone who is practicing and working. What can the MEP do? to help, um, help it feel as though we're an ally, we're there to support, we're not there to make things more difficult. Um, because I think some of the, the challenges and the, um, the racism tends to come out when we are stressed, when we are uh, feeling vulnerable. And so I, I just wonder, as I'm talking to my colleagues, what should I encourage them to remember? And maybe that's a question I can ask everyone to email me the answer. Um, because right now I'm getting the feeling that some of the practices are not sure if they will feel as though their, their identity as um, a racialized person is safe and they're not sure if the MEP understands. And the MEP is not a monolith. It's, it's a group of people who can change, who are malleable. Um, I've seen so much change in 16 years. I can't tell you how much change I've seen. I felt like leaving the second week, but here I still am 16 years later. So it's changed some. There's a lot of change left though to be done. So please send any suggestions. And if I need to come and visit your MPG, your Mitter Free Practice Group, please invite me to come. I'll bring food. Invite me to come. I'll be that elder. I'll be Auntie Carlene, and I'll talk about how destiny is not by accident. Each and every one of us has it. And the web that connects us together is powerful. Thank you, Shazine. Feel free to unmute. Hey, it's Carmi. Um, I know we're talking about like systemic changes, but I think sometimes we have to work from the bottom up too, right? And so I think, um, uh, and Carlene, to your question, it's interesting because as a graduate from the MEP, um, I wasn't really like two phased about in terms of the education I received when I was in it, but when I came into placements and different MPGs that I was part of, it's kind of at that place where I think more education, and I know the MEP has been working towards giving preceptors tools on how placements can be more welcoming, but you still feel it. <laughs> the, like um, 
there is still far and few between in terms of I like people of uh, midwives who are people of color, right? Who are IPOC. Um, so it's hard. So I think it's like, uh, we all know that we make those calculations day to day in our work, in our placements with our colleagues who are not IPOC. And so I don't even know where I'm trying to get at. I'm just trying to, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that um, change has to come from all directions. So whether that means every MPG does like a strategic planning day to talk about these issues as important issues, as important as your protocol for uh, PPH or you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think that that much thought and time is actually given um, towards emotional work of IPOC midwives and, and all the other stuff that we do on top of our clinical care. I, I think so where I'm kind of taking this, um, where I want to take this is like, so what do we do? Right. Like, how, how do we do this? This this space that we have here, um, you know, one of my I've said to many friends here on the screen, like one of my secret like desires is to and it's not going to be secret now that I'm saying it out loud um, is to really build capacity amongst us to take on research and to take on policy development and policy analysis and and not be afraid of the like. I don't really know what I'm doing. I think I'm just going to stick my head and just kind of like muddle my way through because as like Trish mentioned, uh, Minnie, I'm sure maybe Momina as well, Susanna, we all kind of like just kind of like leapt into something and really, you know, leaned on our supervisors or committees or whoever's, our mentors to kind of guide us. And so um, where I'm going this is going back to like graduate school or research, what, whatever we want to call it, and whatever your direction is, oh, I think we lost Carlene there, um, is that for those that are thinking about it, you know, we, for the ones that have done this already, or thinking, or pretty much steps in there, we're all available to have conversations to talk about, like, how do I find my program? I don't know. Um, what do I actually want out of it? How do you deal with, like, how do you get a supervisor? How do you do all these things? Um, you know, like I'm, I'm out here, I'm here, I'm available. Uh, I will meet with anybody who wants to talk about these things. Um, but like, what I really want to be able to do is like build a community of IPOC researchers. And I'm not the best. There's, there's others. I'm just saying I'm one person that can support um, us building this because it really is like many, as you talked about, you know, there's not enough of the topic that you're looking at, right? You're, there's not enough information out there. So like, it's a bit of our evidence if we're going to play like the white man white. game of like I need evidence to prove it because it's real only when we write it well then okay cool no problem we'll play that game too um we just need to start pumping it out now right which is what is going to actually help develop policy which then is like we can write policy I mean these are my big dreams but we can write policy that actually has feeling embedded into it like Susanna you mentioned that has like some common sense pieces that we feel are logical for our communities. So this is like the grand plan, monster plan. Um, but I also wanna see us build capacity, right? Because I'm not gonna do this forever. I need people around that's just gonna fill, fill the next step. So it's like a collective desire for us to build a wave of strength in our community to get the wheels rolling in the ways that we needed to roll, right? So, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping we've inspired some folks to think about it and not totally be afraid of uh, graduate school. But if graduate school is not your thing, but you still wanna do research, you need to just like knock on the door or tap somebody's shoulder, don't be afraid and say, hey, do you got any projects on the go? I'd love to just give my time or my energy or whatever your community needs a project to be done, let us know, right? Um, anyway, okay, I'll get off my horse, but that was kind of where I wanted to kind of left turn this thing. Thank you, Claire. I think those were just wise words to wrap up the session today. Uh, so take home message, we wanna change the system, we've gotta use the system <laughs> to work from within, so. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for that. So um, I want to send a thank you again to all of our speakers for sharing your insights today. 
uh, your contributions have truly enriched our discussions. You've led us uh, into some very deep and meaningful conversations uh, that were both challenging and uplifting. So thank you for that. And as we wrap, wrap up, I wanna encourage everyone to keep an eye out for CAN's newsletter, where, uh, where you'll find upcoming opportunities to participate in various projects that rely on the input of midwives and midwifery students. Your involvement can make a significant difference. And thank you as well to all of the participants for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye.